Fabulous. So we're streaming. We're live. We're just going to wait for folks to join. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get talking. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's dive in. My name is Blair Armani. I'm an author and a historian of two books, um, being Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration of the Black American Dream, and Modern History, Stories of Women and Non-Binary People Rewriting History. I'm here with Arlen Hamilton. Um, did I say that right? I meant to ask you ahead of time. because I. Oh, yeah. Just, you, said fabulous. you said it, Arlen. Yeah, Arlen Hamilton, um, and just an amazing quote right here from the Backstage Capital website. We invest in the very best founders who identify as women, people of color, or LGBTQ. I personally identify as all three. Um, I do as well, so I'm very excited to be uh, with the kindred spirit here. Um, it's often said birds of a feather fly together. Right now, we're in a moment where so many people are just now getting hip to the fact that we are worth investing in, but you've been doing this for the past nine years. Um, I want to quiz folks a little bit once we get more folks in the room, but let's start with um, what your journey has been like to this current moment at a time where people are now finally realizing, oh, snap, maybe we should invest in these folks. Yeah. Uh, so my journey coming, I came from outside of the industry and I still feel like I'm outside of the industry, with, which I think is, a, is probably a good thing. Um and I had no idea what a venture capitalist was 10 years ago or 11 years ago. I'm 39 now. Uh, in my early 30s, I had had a few lives already and had been on the road at that time working with musicians as a production coordinator or a road manager. So I worked with um, people like Tony Braxton and, and Jason Derulo and people like that. But, you know, behind the scenes, on I the apologize. Road. I have to say Jason Derulo. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and, and, you know, you know, I just think about like working with so many people and, and, J and Tony and Jason were two of the nicest people I've ever worked for. Uh, so I always want to shout them out. It was just very, you know, um, behind the scenes work. I was a production coordinator and, and worked on the road and, um, you know, that kind of work isn't, isn't, st um, stable. Like it's really fun and it's really interesting and you get to travel and have these great experiences, but it's not, it's not, there's no job security there and there's no insurance and there's no this and that. So although I was sort of living a dream, definitely at that point, I also started like, I was off the road a lot. So I was looking for other ways to, to make things work. And I started noticing that there were these people who were, uh, celebrities or their management or, you know, adjacent celebrity adjacent. And they were making these small investments in a place called Silicon Valley. And I was living in Texas at the time. And I had been around, you know, the country and a, and a few places around the world, but I didn't quite understand what Silicon Valley was or what it meant. And so that, that curiosity got, took over. So I started studying what are they, what are they investing? What types of, what, what are these companies are, you know, is this anything to be interested in? And then once I dove in more, I realized, man, this is what, this is what I have been looking for. And I didn't even realize it. Like this felt so like these people who are, had these moonshot ideas and were creating things and from the ground up and just a small team or even by themselves. That's what I had been doing my whole life. I just didn't know what to call it. So that curiosity just led to more and more, um, digging and, and then deciding to start a company and, um, a tech company. And in that research to start that in my early thirties, that is when I started coming up, you know, up, coming upon these statistics that, that we now know that were just so ridiculous, uh, when it came to funding for, for mm -hmm. anyone who wasn't a straight white man. And that's when I decided, you know, things are going to, I'm going to have to do things a little bit different. And the, the title of your new book is called It's About Damn Time, which came out in May, I believe. Um, yes. It's all about how to turn being underestimated into your greatest advantage. I try to do that a lot. Um, I found before I started wearing my hijab, and, and you have your book right behind you as well. Um, hey. But I found um, as I was 
starting to work a job, people stopped perceiving me as a black woman. And then when I started to speak up, they would be like, wow, you're such a vocal Muslim woman. Thank you for like going against the odds. And so I've been trying to do a little bit of that in my own context, try to figure out how the things that they don't anticipate that you do can really give you a cutting edge because they don't think that we're, you know, intelligent. They don't think that we're considering these things, but we are, and we always happen. Yeah, that's incredible. I love that because uh, uh, that's very, such a clear way of describing um, using that in, the, in in a special way. Yeah, that's interesting. And you identify as, as everything. <clears throat> Pardon me. You, you identify as all of it, right? It's all mm-hmm. truly you. It's it's not uh, any sort of facade, uh, but it's it's y- using certain assets, you know, in, in a way. Yeah, it's about perception. Um, and so one thing I think that is very perception heavy that I want to dive into very intently is this idea of equal access. I think that a lot of folks have been under the mindset, uh, and I could you know speak to it from a historical standpoint, that we've always had equal access, you know, well, we're equal opportunity lender, we equal opportunity hiring, but at a certain stage that breaks down and the breakdown falls along racial lines, it falls along, um, you know, sexist lines, patriarchal lines, etc. Um, A figure from my book, Making Our Way Home, is about redlining and how, you know, during the 1950s, when everyone had access to housing, um, black folks were only able to get federal housing loans 2% of the time. That means 98% of housing loans between 1934 and 1968 went to white families. That's generational wealth right here. And because I'm a historian and an educator, we're going to quiz the audience and we're going to use this fun poll feature. I want y'all to guess. um, Hold on. Guess how much venture capitalist dollars, and then can you explain what a VC is? So I'm a venture capitalist, and a venture capitalist and venture capitalism, it's all about, uh, it's a it's a small sliver of the private equity asset class, and it's just meant, the money is supposed to go towards high, higher risk, uh, higher outcome companies at an earlier stage, and, um, and just uh, in, uh, catalyze innovation. And so, you know, uh, it's supposed to be very inclusive. It's supposed to be very accepting. It's supposed to look for outliers and it's supposed to be so have such a high risk tolerance that it almost is scoffed at by uh, your your average uh, private equity or hedge fund manager. Um, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. And that's not the, that's not the venture capital landscape that I came across when I, when I started looking into it. All right. I think I got the question marked down. I might have to make the question a little bit more abbreviated. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So venture oh. is just, yeah. Venture is just, uh, it's capital. It's capital. It's, it's money to put behind c- smaller companies like this one, like we're on this platform or Twitter or Facebook or Apple, uh, or or Airbnb, those types of companies started very, very small. And they wanted to go grow really, really large. Let's see what so, the options are. Yes, I've asked you all what percentage of venture capitalist dollars go to black founders. You all are not an optimistic crowd. <laughs> um, I gave 6%, 10%, 12%, or 2%. And let's see, make sure I get kind of a groundswell of answers. This is very interesting because... Uh, I think folks might think it's 10%. Oftentimes when it comes to hiring or when it comes to like um, equal opportunity, people think, oh, it should, you know, if we're not racist, then it should fall along the same percentage lines of a population of of people. But of course that doesn't account for um, certain communities not having access to tech, certain communities being the black communities, you know, not everyone has a garage to found a company in. So that means that there's going to be a dearth of opportunities for some of us. All right, let's see. I'll give you all a couple more seconds and we will end the call and and reveal. Let's see. All right, we got most folks voting. Some folks didn't vote. I understand. It's okay. No voter suppression here, though. I'm going to end the poll. So (laughs) the answer is 2%. You all were correct. Unfortunately, only 2% of um, Black founders receive access to startup money. And that also includes folks who have mixed foundings, um, meaning they have one black founder and another founder um, who is white or of a person of color. I would like to really draw on your expertise here, Arlen, because I, you know, it's one thing to say 2%. What has that looked like in 
daily life, especially over the past nine years, as you've been working, you know, really robustly to change that? I actually think 2% is generous. Um, if that's, you know, the um, amount of venture that's going to black founders, I think it's generous because I know that for black women, it's supposed to supposedly 0.2% or less. And I say supposedly because I see it every day. So what it looks like is I have some mm-hmm. recent examples, you know, um, I just talked to a, a white male founder who's a friend of mine and I've known him for years and he has, I think he's raised like $50 million at a $200 million valuation. Nothing against what he's doing and nothing to say he shouldn't have. But I have companies in our portfolio that I've invested in who do almost the same that he does, who couldn't raise uh, 500000 if they tried. And, and I think he might be the first to admit that it's because of the rooms he can get into and the peop- and the, um, the, mm-hmm. the bias that's already there and then the bias towards him that, that he would have. And you see this day in and day out. You see this incredible companies. Like when I go into to, to talk about this, a lot of people kind of, they kind of tilt their head a little bit like, Oh, bless your heart. Like you're working with these underprivileged founders. And I'm like, you don't understand. I am you're taking such a risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm the least educated. I'm the least uh, experienced person of my portfolio. Like I walk in a room and I have to keep up with everybody in that portfolio. And it's, it's, they, they are working on things that are incredible. They are incredible people. It's just that they're simply being underestimated and overlooked. And they're, be, they're being put into a, 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 a box of because you're black, you, you, you're not, you, you can't be working on something uh, venture scalable. You can't be working on something global. You can't be working on something that white people would use, which apparently is important. It's not accurate, but even if it were, that's not even important because if you think about how many uh, people of color there are in this country and how many there will be in the next decade or two. But all of that translates to really uh, incredible, viable well, people being put into a box and being shut out of opportunity. And the thing is, you know, I, I talk about the founding of hip hop in my book as well. If hip hop was a tech startup, which was created, you know, instead of it being a genre of music created by um, people who spoke, who were Francophone, who spoke French, who spoke, um, you know, Haitian Creole, who spoke Spanish, who spoke, you know, African American English and created the most like important cultural export of the United States. People, you know, it was underestimated, especially by white audiences. Yet, if that had a valuation where people were investing, like if, if we look at things like cultural appropriation, it's very clear that white folks are very keen to borrow, uh, sometimes even steal from the black community when it comes to thinking about things that are pop- popular and things that are profitable. But then they don't want to about, val- you know, value us. And the other thing, the last thing I'll say is that thing pro- platforms like Twitter and Instagram have been you know, completely used by the black community and really made it more interesting and more cool. So why aren't we getting those tech dollars? And it's really because of the underestimation. Yeah, I was on a a documentary on PBS called Boss, uh, talking about black Americans and and business over the years. And the little part that I had towards the end was right after the the hip hop version. So the Jay-Z's and the Diddy's. And but I, I, you know, I didn't know it was going to be there, but I said this in my interview. I said, do you know how frustrating it is to walk into a, a VC's office and have them bumping Drake? But I know that they don't write checks to black people. Like how insulting mm-hmm. that is. Right? Like they're, they're doing it in front of our faces. Like they have this value. And even with hip hop, I mean, it's only outliers that really reap the benefits of that. And, and right now, most of the people who own record labels or who, who, who make the most money as managers, most of them are white and most of them are men. And, and it's, 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 it's like we get excited if we, if we get a record deal or if we get a, even if, you know, I just had a book deal and I'm, and I got excited about it and I start, th- you know, deconstructing that. And I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> you know, like all of this is. Let's look at the terms and conditions. Only- Right. All of this is owned by uh, uh, others. And, and I, I just I really want to turn that on its head in my lifetime. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm having a similar situation where, you know, because of this groundswell of interest in anti-racism, my platform on Instagram has grown from 
50,000 followers in May to almost 200,000 followers. And so I'm looking at agencies wow. and they really bank on the fact my dad keeps saying, don't be Scotty Pippen. And if folks, you know, recently saw that, uh, you know, Michael Jordan documentary, they'll know what that means, where he was so excited oh, to be able to means. cater for his mean? family and be able to. Oh, no problem. So he was so excited to be able to invest in his family and like make a money and get a check and sign a contract that he ended up getting shafted in the short term where he was like, oh, I have a long uh, in the long term. Rather, I have a short term gain. I'll sign this right now. I'll get my advance. But I have no royalties. I don't own my name. I don't even own my own image. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing that is troublesome. I realized that I have, you know, a certain amount of privilege because I was able to call my uncle who's a lawyer at Box Rothschild and say, hey, can you go through this contract with me? But not everyone has that. And not everyone has yeah. the time to wait um, because rent is due. Um, one thing I want to say, uh, especially in this current conversation from, you know, rejection to revolution and being resilient, there is what I think is kind of this like dim glimmer of hope where a lot of people are realizing that racism is, is an issue. People are buying white, white fragility. Hopefully they're reading it, but there's no way for us to know. You know, they're blacking out the bestseller list. Hopefully they're reading, but there's no way for us to know. How can black mm. startup founders or folks who have been the squeaky wheel for a long time about these issues get the courage to say something again and hopefully be invested in this time? Oh, well, I mean, this is this is the time. This is the time to do it if if you can, because... Um, so many people have, we've been just saying this over and over again. We've been screaming at the top of our lungs and it just hasn't been heard the way it's being heard right now. And whether it's through guilt or shame or whatever, I mean, at this point, we can't be responsible for why someone else on the other side is sort of not the other side, but you know, someone else is hearing that as long as we have in our, this is my opinion in our hearts, you know, the do no harm mantra. That's, that's where I come from. So if it's a do no harm mantra within and you, you can't control how the other person is going to receive it. But here's the thing. I think there are a lot of allies and I'm going to just use very broad terms, you know, but I think there are a lot of allies within corporations and within certain institutions who have in the past wanted to be able to do something and really use their co corporations dollars or use their institutions dollars to really make change and really, you know, as Tiffany says, hire and wire, but they haven't been able to because they they get excited about it within the company. They go on this little tour of, you know, this little black people tour and they just sort of like meet all the, you know, the usual suspects and they get excited and then they take it back internal and it gets shut down because it's just an HR problem. It's just a this. It's just marketing. I think right now those very same people who shut it down are asking and, and scrambling and saying, where do we find, what do we do? And that, so that you have those allies, if you have those allies within, they're needing you, uh, they're needing to take this back. Right. So I just think that there's this direct line we now have. Um, and, and why not, why not use this opportunity in 2017? I was at Afrotech and I said on camera that uh, within two or so years, so I'm a, I'm a few months off, but I said within two or so years, something was going to happen uh, the, in the tech ecosystem that was going to shock the ecosystem and that was going to make it rain for black founders, black and brown founders. And that just as fast as that happened, it was going to go away. So mm -hmm. it was going to probably be a two to three year period that it would happen and it would just be, you know, the new, this new landscape, but then it was going to dry out because people would get over it. People would get tired and they'd go back to their old ways. And that's where I think we're, we're in that right now. We're at the beginning of that right now. So it's important to be really methodical and strategic as this is coming your way. Like you say with Scotty Pippen, you don't want to just take any old dollar just because there's an ex uh, opportunity now and people are sort of seeing that. You want to be strategic and, and who you align yourself with and who you accept money and opportunity from, because we have so much more power and leverage than anyone is giving us credit for, including ourselves. Why would we give that away at this moment that is a once in a lifetime moment for us? Absolutely. I was actually just having a conversation with someone who I've taken on as a mentee. Um, I've had the ability to get access largely thanks to LeVar Burton. My first book was published because LeVar Burton shouted me out. I was in the middle of funding the book. And LeVar Burton, if you don't know who he is, yes, you do. Kunta Kinte mm -hmm. fame, Star Trek fame, Reading Rainbow, taught me how to read. Um, an yeah. enthusiastic reader. And he just shouted me out on Twitter as I was looking for a publisher and said, somebody published this woman's book. 
And even though I had that access where people were suddenly reaching out and saying, we want to see your proposal. We want to speak to your agent. I was like, absolutely. In the truth, I didn't know what an agent was. I didn't know literary agents existed. I didn't know that book proposals were a thing. So I called one of my girlfriends, Feminista Jones, who's also featured in the book, and she broke it down for me. But we still got 17 rejections. I think that, uh, mm. and, and then we got, you know, signed with 10 Speed Press. They're amazing. Um, but I think that there's a lot of, people are easily going to get discouraged. And it makes sense, right? Because just because a new opportunity presents itself doesn't mean that it's a golden opportunity or it's perfect. It still might be something that you have to reject or that rejects you. So how do you stay resilient through this? Because I know as you are getting started, just by the nature of this, you know, very racist, white supremacist world we live in, that's also very patriarchy heavy and homophobic. You didn't come on the scene of the tech world and they were like, hey, Arlen, we love you. This is amazing. Come sit at all our tables. <laughs> yeah. How did you stay powerful through that? Oh, I I leaned into just being myself and being authentic. And and I, you know, you have a couple of test runs at that. I'm, I, I would never stop doing it, but I was like, let me see, you know, what happens here. And I would get all kinds of uh, feedback from people who didn't want me here. And there's still people who don't want me here. Oh, all mm -hmm. day long, you know? Um, but I would, what, what would matter to me the most would be the people who reached out on the D in the DMS or in conversation. And they said, you know, thank you for saying and doing what you're doing. Cause if I did that, I get fired or I can't, I can't say that in within the confines of my circumstances right now. And I just kind of had this window of opportunity myself to to just be something so different and not be afraid to lose anything because I I had plenty to lose uh, when, when it came to integrity and dignity and and livelihood and all of that but you know when you're starting from scratch and you have seen what it's like for 35 years 35 of 39 years I was poor so when you when you when you've seen what that's like and that you can get through that you know, you don't, you don't give up too much. That's why I always say, don't give up too much leverage. I didn't give mm -hmm. up too much. So I was just all about, and I still am. I'm, I'm about the person in the back of the room who, who figured out a way to take two trains, get a babysitter, uh, you know, got their, got their, uh, clothes, knitted their clothes together, you know, whatever they had to do to get in that room and to shyly listen in and to come up to me and say, you know, this is the first conference I've ever been to, and I came here to see you. And this, I'm looking for her. Or like, you know what I mean? This is I'm talking to her. I don't care if there's any everybody else in the whole room has their arms folded and is looking at me like time's up. You know, to me, it's it's about that, and it's been about that, and I see that in, impact every single day. And man, I tell you what, you get this. I know you have to um, this vitriol, and it's usually personal you know they come at you but um I just have to go past that have to look past all that noise absolutely um that resonates with me so much because I really find what fuels the work is those few people you're not going to please everybody and you're not do you're not there to do that you're not there to change everybody's minds but it's there to be vocal and maybe catch the ear of somebody who really needed to hear it or really needed that investment or really needed that, you know, five minute conversation. Um, and I would encourage folks to do that. That's something that we can all do regardless of our, you know, personal standing. We can all mm -hmm. take that opportunity to say, Hey, you know, um, for like my book, um, the illustrator told me a price for her rate. And I was like, please raise that price, you know? And it was just a quick mm -hmm. call that we had to make. Cause it's no skin off my bones to be able to do yeah. that. Um, yeah. So let's give, let's leave our audience. And then there is like uh, Hassan said, there's a cocktail hour after this and it's really fun. You join on your phone and you'll be able to cycle through and chat for five minutes with a bunch of different folks. Um, but what would you like to leave folks with? Ooh, uh, well, I, 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 I hope that you'll pick up. It's about damn time. It's a new book, you know, available. I also read the audio and in that book, I say something that I've been saying for a while now, but, um, I have it written across my wall in my home office. So I get to look at it every time I get online and I hope it's helpful to someone. Um, I say to be yourself so that the people looking for you can find you. Mm. And um, I just really mean that. And I'll say it again because people ask me to say it again, be yourself so that the people looking for you can find you. 
that's authentic. I've been completely authentic in this space. I mean, maybe once or twice when I decided to kind of strike out of that, it, it, it backfired in such a big way. I, um, it is not, this is not an easy road, whatever you're working on, you know, it's not an easy road to be these things in this world, in this country, but you have to wake up to yourself every day and, and being someone else, being inauthentic to reach a goal. Once you're at that goal, you have to stay in that costume. Mm. So why would you want to do that and set yourself up that way? And so I know it's easier said than done. And I know that is really tough. I've been homeless. I've been on food stamps. Um, I've seen a lot, but I stayed myself all throughout it. And now, you know, raised millions of dollars, generated millions of dollars in revenue, invested in more than 100 companies and five years staying myself. So that's what I hope for everybody. That's beautiful. Um, I often leave folks with something similar. I didn't have a lot of friends growing up and now I'm very popular and everybody's reaching out to me now and everybody's rooting for me, but I didn't have to change who I was. So that's beautiful. Um, thank you so much. I really love that. Um, be yourself so the people looking for you can find you. That is our tweetable takeaway for today. Let's leave us all with a group fee. So this is a group selfie. So everybody look real cute in your camera. And then I will click this button and hopefully it'll go somewhere and everyone can see it. All right, let's do it. Ready? Sure. <laughs> oh, I want to retake it. Cool, then I think it all comes together. Um, I think it happened. <laughs> Alrighty. So while folks finish that up, thank you so much, Arlen. Um, and please follow both of us on social media, buy our books, please buy It's About Damn Time. Excellent book. Um, and the audiobook is read by the author herself. Huh. Right. All right, y'all. Okay. So if you're done your selfie, please head over to the cocktail hour, which is on the same app. It's on your phone, front facing camera, and you'll be able to do five minute conversations with a variety of different folks where we can talk about the takeaways from today. It's really exciting that we're using a four month old platform talking about tech startups and talking about how we can uh, invest yeah, that's amazing. Uh, in a more diverse way. Okay. All right, I'm just waiting for folks to get their selfies in. So I'll just waffle around oh. here. <laughs> <laughs> Nineteen people finished the selfie. Can we get to well, twenty? It, it pops up and says you got to take the picture. Somebody may not notice that. Oh yes, please look for pop ups, y'all. Oh, okay. Another person did it. You got thirty seconds. Then we're toodalooing. Um, y'all can stay if you'd like. Y'all can go over to the happy hour for the dialogue. I'm going to go ahead and end the group fee. Yes. Oh, and it's rendering a photo. All right. I will save it and make sure that it gets sent out to everybody. Awesome. All right. Toodaloo, y'all. Have a lovely day. Thanks, y'all. I don't think I ended the talk, so I'm trying to come back and end it. <laughs> oh, the joys of using new user interfaces. Let's see. Okay, bottom left button. Is it the one that says leave? Just wait for it. Okay, great. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>